All right. All right, so folks are slowly starting to trickle in. Hello, welcome. We are glad you all are here this evening. We're gonna give it just a couple of minutes uh, to let folks join us. Again, thank you for being here. For those of you who are just entering, hopefully you can hear me clearly. Uh, if you would like, I'd love to learn where you're joining us from. Please feel free to drop in the chat where you're joining us from. Uh, and if you feel inclined, even share something that you are hoping to learn today. Alicia from Forestville, welcome. A lot of people joining us from Santa Rosa. That's fantastic. Jenna, I see that you have indicated a raise hand feature. Please know that we're going to be engaging with folks in this program via the chat. <laughs> Leah writes, I want to learn how to convince others to do the work as it is not that hard. Thank you. I look forward to uh, learning from our experts about the simplicity of drip irrigation. All right. I think at this time, I'm sure folks are going to continue to join us. Panelists, how do you feel about just kicking things off and getting it started? Let's go. All Sounds right, good. let's do it. Thank you. Well, welcome everybody. Tonight we are going to be covering drip irrigation basics. We are joined by some amazing panelists and experts from the UC Master Gardener Program and the Garden Sense Program of Sonoma County. And this program is brought to you through a collaboration with Daily Axe Organization and Santa Rosa Water. We are so thrilled that all of you are here today. My name is Liz and I am the Climate Resilient Program Manager at Daily Axe. For those of you who don't know, Daily Axe is a small and mighty environmental education nonprofit based in Petaluma and working throughout Sonoma County to provide people with the knowledge, skills, and resources to be able to live a rich and full lifestyle while also having a smaller environmental impact. Daily Axe works to connect people and build community through our education programs, like the one we have this evening, our action campaigns, and by influencing policies that address the climate crisis. Over the last 20 years, our impacts have been far and wide, and we are so grateful for the partnerships that we've made along the way, and for all of you that continue to show up and believe in the power of your daily actions. So thank you again for being here this evening. As I was just mentioning, tonight's program is a Zoom webinar. So the way that you're going to interact with the program is through the chat box. For most folks, the chat box may be found at the top of your screen or at the bottom of your screen. Questions will be dropped in the Q&A. Um, sorry if I misspoke there. The Q&A is solely just for questions and the chat is to be able to interact with your fellow attendees or with your panelists. If you do wish to use the chat, please make sure that your settings are on everyone or all panelists and attendees. And again, if any questions come up, please use the Q&A. We are going to hold all questions until the end of the program. So before we get started talking about drip irrigation, I just want to set a little bit of groundwork. I'm sure you all are aware the drought is still here. It is critical that everyone is saving water whenever possible. It is really important that we all do our part to preserve and extend our water supply, especially during this dry period. Currently, Lake Mendocino, which supplies our upper river communities as well as Healdsburg North, is at about 59% of its targeted storage level. And Lake Sonoma, which provides water to the majority of Sonoma County, is at about 53% of its storage level. So we have quite a ways to go before we are back at safe storage levels. In response to the regional water supply conditions and our historically low reservoir storage, the city of Santa Rosa continues to require a 20% mandatory community-wide reduction in water use. In addition, there are also water restrictions that are still in effect, which I'll touch on in just a moment. 
Santa Rosa and many other cities are asking residents to make behavior changes that can help to eliminate water waste and conserve water. I can't emphasize this enough. We are all in this together and it is so critical that we make every drop of water count. So like I just mentioned, I wanna briefly highlight some of the mandates that the city of Santa Rosa has in store. First off, it is prohibited to wash your surfaces with potable water. All of the mandates that I'm about to mention, again, are all an effort to help us conserve water whenever possible. So no washing hard surfaces with potable water. Pressure washing with potable water is also not allowed. It is required to repair your indoor and outdoor uh, appliances for any water leaks. If you need assistance identifying leaks, you can reach out to your city, check out their website, or reach out to me at DailyAx to receive resources and better understand how you can read your water meter to detect those leaks. I also know that the city of Santa Rosa has phenomenal resources for leak detection, and they offer free dye tablets so that you can test your indoor appliances for any leaks. It is also required that folks have a shutoff nozzle on all of your hoses. This is another free resource that the city of Santa Rosa will provide. They will provide you with that hose nozzle. And then lastly, landscape irrigation can only be applied between the hours of 8 p.m. and 6 a.m. as an effort to reduce evaporation. So whether you live in Santa Rosa, a surrounding area, or even in another state, I would highly encourage you to review your city's water page to learn more about what you can do to conserve water, as well as what resources your city or county has to offer to support you. All right, well, without any further ado, like I continue to mention, we have some really phenomenal experts joining us this evening. I'm gonna give some, a brief introduction to all of them. So Leslie, has lived and gardened in Sonoma County for almost 30 years after living in Canada, Australia, and other parts of the US. Moving to the hills above Sonoma as a newlywed, a friend helped her with her first vegetable garden and she discovered irrigation, as well as deer and gophers. Now, Leslie lives in Pengrove, where she incorporates native and water-wise plants into her landscape, as well as growing vegetables year round. She especially enjoys figuring out how to best irrigate the many different sections of her garden efficiently and according to their water needs. Retired after many years of teaching high school chemistry, Leslie has been a master gardener and, and Sonoma County Garden Sense consultant since 2017. She is currently the coordinator for the Garden Sense program. Mark has lived in California for most of his life, mainly in the San Francisco Bay Area. At a young age, Mark was inspired by a neighbor to spend time in the garden. He worked in a plant nursery in the early 1970s and then started his own garden maintenance business and soon became a California licensed landscaper. Enjoying the intricacies and challenges of creating irrigation systems, Mark later worked for the city of San Mateo as an irrigation specialist for 14 years. In retirement, he joined the master gardeners of San Mateo and San Francisco in 2018 and transferred to Sonoma County Master Gardeners in 2021 when he moved to the city of Santa Rosa. Mark is currently living the life in Sonoma County and serving as a Garden Sense consultant. Mary Lou was born and raised in the San Francisco Bay Area where she learned to appreciate the art of gardening because her parents strove to make their garden a beautiful, welcoming space for humans and wildlife. Moving to Santa Rosa in the late 1960s, she was busy raising two children and earning her secondary teaching degree. Landing a job with the Santa Rosa City Schools, she went on to teach English, world history, humanities, and journalism during her 30-year tenure, achieving the national board status before retiring. Always eager to learn something new and to continue to serve her community and the Sonoma County Master Gardener program is a perfect fit. Teaching and gardening, what more could you ask for? So with that, I would really love to pass it over to Leslie, Mary Lou, and Mark to talk to us this evening about drip irrigation. And again, thank you all for being here and for this partnership. I am so excited to learn from you all. Thanks very much, Liz. And let me go ahead and share our screen. And get myself organized here. Okay. There we go. And there we are. 
Before we begin our presentation, I would like to introduce you to Garden Steps. In partnership with the Sonoma County Water Agency, otherwise known as Sonoma Water, we have been helping Sonoma County residents reduce water use in their landscapes for nine years. We are a unique program within the UC Master Gardener Program of Sonoma County. We are the only program where teams of master gardeners visit homeowners in person. During our 90-minute visits, we advise and educate residents who are interested in water conserving measures in their landscape. This includes converting or reducing your lawn, converting your spray irrigation to drip, and or upgrading your existing irrigation to conserve water in your landscape, both of which are topics of our presentation today. We also advise residents on low water use climate appropriate plants and provide landscape ideas and suggestions for how to hydrozone. We made a record 289 Garden Sense visits across Sonoma County last year, and we have made over 1,400 visits since our inception in 2013. You can request a free Garden Sense visit and learn about these topics as they apply to your landscape. To request a visit, click on the link here on the screen, or you can take a screenshot with your phone or go to our Sonoma County Master Gardener website and click on the Garden Sense icon. This link will also be available in the follow-up email. Today's topic is drip irrigation basics. Mary Lou, Mark, and I are Sonoma County Master Gardeners and Garden Sense consultants who specialize in irrigation, as well as describing the components you need to set up your own drip system We've included some specific projects that you can tackle to get your feet wet. Pun intended. Drip irrigation is more efficient than either hand watering or sprinklers. Unlike other forms of irrigation, such as sprinklers that are only 65 to 75% efficient, drip irrigation can be 90% efficient at allowing plants to use the water applied. Water dribbles slowly into the ground, which results in less runoff and less evaporation. Drip irrigation applies the water slowly at the plant root zone where it is needed most. There are multiple ways to build drip systems, and we will describe some of them here this evening. Would you tell us about soil, Mary Lou? Thank you, Leslie. Uh, soil, before we get into drip, uh, it's very important that uh, you know the type of soil you have because it determines how often you irrigate, how long you irrigate, how fast your emitters run, otherwise known as emitter flow rate, such as 0.5 gallons per hour or 0.9 gallons per hour and how far apart you place your drip emitter, six inches, 12 inches, 18 inches. So um, the three components that make up soil texture are sand, silt, and clay. Sand is coarse. It's made up of large particles and has large pore spaces that can accept water quickly. Clay is made up of fine, tiny particles and tiny pore spaces. <laughs> Silt has a structure in between. These characteristics affect how water is absorbed into the soil. We need to adjust our irrigation to best suit the soil type in our landscapes. Think of it this way. Apply water to see how fast the soil can drink it. Clay sips, sand gulps. Water moves easily into and through sandy soil, so frequent irrigation with short run times works best. Gravity is the main force on water and sand. It pulls the water straight down and out of the root zone. Add water faster with a higher emitter rate, such as 0.9 gallons per hour. Apply water slowly for clay with a slow emitter rate, such as 0.5 gallons per hour. 
The soil can only take it in slowly, sip it. In order to get enough water into the soil, you may need to stop and add more water a little later, for example, an hour. Water hangs onto the clay particles for a while due to capillary action. Described as the movement of water within the spaces of a porous material due to the forces of adhesion, cohesion, and surface tension. Therefore, watering plants in clay soil by hand gives deceptive results. Water will pool quickly and begin to run off. Stop watering. Wait an hour and water again. Cycled run times called cycle and soak. So, yeah, sorry. Help push the first cycle's water further down because you let it soak in and then add more water. Check out the widths at the bottom of each diagram, 12 inches for sandy soil and over 24 inches for clay. This is why emitters need to be closer together for sand than for clay. Here's the citation from Whiting et al., the source of the graphic. Water movement is directly related to the size of pores in the soil. In the small pores of clay soils, water slowly moves in all directions by capillary action. The lack of large pore space leads to drainage problems and low soil oxygen levels. In sandy soils with large pores, water readily drains downwards by gravitational pull. Excessive irrigation and or precipitation can leach water soluble nutrients like necessary nitrogen out of the root zone and into the groundwater. From the diagram, if we leave the water running, it will take 48 hours to get to 72 inches in clay and only 24 hours to get to the same depth in sand. Okay, yeah, thank you. Regardless of the type of soil you have, it's a good idea to actually find out whether water is getting to where you want it to be. Here are a few suggestions for how to do that. Wait until the water has infiltrated into the ground, then use your finger or a screwdriver Use a soil probe as shown on the slide or dig down with a thin trowel. When soil moves from wet to dry, you can feel the change in consistency. There are a few ways you can find out your soil texture. Have a soil sample tested by a lab or the do it yourself. Google soil ribbon test to find directions and videos. That soil ribbon test you can Google. And uh, you can also Google mason jar soil test for another method. So you can do it yourself and find that out. Your prominent sand, silt, clay. How deep should we water? To answer that question, we need to understand root depth. Trees, two to three feet. Shrubs, 18 to 24 inches. Perennials, 12 to 18 inches. And annuals, 8 to 12 inches. Most of the action is in the top three feet of soil. Air can only go so far into soil. Most of the time, we don't need to irrigate as long as we think we do. This is why we need hydrosomes. Before we jump into the details about drip systems, we want to introduce you to one of the key strategies for reducing water use in your landscape, hydrozones. Hydrozoning means grouping plants with similar water and sun needs together on the same valve. To water these groups of plants efficiently, we create separate irrigation zones within our landscape. Each zone includes the source of water and all the associated irrigation. For example, one valve or hose bib, 
plus all the drip tubing coming from that valve or hose bib, otherwise known as a faucet, that doesn't necessarily mean that all the plants are in the same place. Check out how the shrubs and perennials are watered together and trees are on their own valve. So looking at this diagram, you can probably discern that it is easier to do hydrozoning before you have an established landscape. And don't forget your containers. Your pots on the porch require daily water with short run times. Trees need very infrequent deep watering. Note that this hydrozone diagram does not reflect the current firewise landscaping recommendations for no plants in the zero to five zone around your house where inorganic types of mulch are best. So if you have an established landscape and you're looking at this diagram and going, oh my goodness, how can I possibly do that? Well, uh, it can be done in phases. It, it's not impossible, but when you are dealing with an established landscape, you have to water to the plant that requires the highest amount of water. Mark, please tell us about sprinkler to drip conversion and drip irrigation components. Thank you, Mary Lou. Um, drip irrigation is appropriate for existing lawns as well as for shrub bed conversions. Drip, ir drip irrigation results in less runoff, less evaporation, fewer weeds, and when you have drip, no plants are blocked out by the sprinkler heads. No water on the leaves means less fungal disease, especially important when water restrictions mean we irrigate only at night. The picture in this in the slide shows a typical sprinkler head installation to PVC. Filters and pressure regulators are required whether you are converting from sprinklers or beginning your drip system from scratch. A filter keeps small particles from clogging your drip line emitters. A pressure regulator is needed since drip irrigation is designed to work within a certain range of pressures in order for the emitters to work properly and to ensure that compression and compression type fittings do not come apart. Pressure decreases going uphill and increases going downhill or at the end of long runs. The first picture is of a filter. An additional or larger filter may be needed for well owners. Next is a pressure regulator. And third is a combination unit which has a filter and pressure regulator. These work fine for municipal water customers, including the city of Santa Rosa. The last example is of a conversion kit, which contains a combination filter and pressure regulator. Here are three ways you can convert your spray system to drip. All of them require the addition of a filter and pressure regulator. One way is to use a spray to drip conversion kit. Converting at the valve is more robust and maintenance is easier. We will describe two scenarios for converting at the valve. We'll talk about these three ways in the following slides. Here are the steps for converting overhead sprinklers to drip. Irrigation using a conversion kit. Choose a sprinkler head that is in a good location, top of a slope, out of the way so you don't trip on it. Remove the sprinkler head, Teflon tape and nipple Install the conversion kit, remove all the remaining sprinkler heads, Teflon tape the nipples and cap off. On the bottom row, you can see the components of a conversion kit, a small filter on top, which includes a pressure regulator. On the bottom row, to the right, you see an example of the conversion kit in the ground attached to a drip distribution tubing. Downsides to the conversion kit. The filter is small, which means cleaning is needed more often. The head needs to stay above ground so that the filter can be accessed and cleaned periodically. 
the lines sometimes, talking about the distribution lines, sometimes need to be disconnected in order to accomplish this, but not always. And the above ground head may be kicked, stepped on, driven over, or inadvertently broken in other ways. Converting a drip system at the valve provides a more robust system than a conversion kit. Two versions are shown here. In version A, you abandon all the underground PVC, add the required filter and pressure regulator right at the valve, then run your drip system from there. One thing I have forgotten to mention is the water supply ball valve before the irrigation valve. It is important to be able to isolate a broken irrigation system so you, have, so you don't have to turn off all your water in order to do irrigation repairs. Also, an anti-siphon anti -siphon valve in the example is a backflow preventer. And version B is especially good in an area, if the area you want to irrigate is on the other side of sidewalks, driveways, or other forms of hardscape. Add the filter and pressure re regulator as you do in version A, identify the sprinkler head or heads in the area you want to irrigate. Follow the sprinkler head, remove the sprinkler head and replace it with a riser and suitable connections for drip tubing. As with the conversion kit, you need to remove the rest of the sprinkler heads and cap them off. Here is a photo of the valve conversions we have been speaking about. Here you have the filter and pressure regulator properly installed. We are going to talk about valves in more detail later. Here is an overview of the components for a drip system. Begin with some type of backflow preventer. Then you have the valves and or hose bib assemblies are mechanisms to open and close, allowing the water to flow into the landscape. Filters and pressure regulators are required for drip systems. And then you have the tubing emitters and fittings that re are required to put the whole system together. Backflow preventers are devices that are installed on your home water pipes that allow water to flow in one direction and not the opposite. Their purpose is to pre prevent drinking water from being contaminated from other sources because of backflow. A vacuum breaker is a backflow preventer. It is a threaded device that attaches onto a faucet. It prevents water from flowing backwards into your plumbing. This is a component of the drip system that is often forgotten. Backflow prevention is required by the city of Santa Rosa and the state of California for your health and the health of your neighbors. Your backflow prevention device is installed right at the beginning of your system at what is known as your point of connection. This example shows a simple vacuum breaker at the hose bib, otherwise known as an outdoor faucet. Valves are the gatekeepers for your irrigation system. Here are examples of two typical valve installations. In the left-hand photo, you can see the anti-siphon valves, which have two components. One is the valve itself, and the other is the vacuum breaker to prevent water from moving back into your house. These valves need to be located at least six inches above the highest level of that individual valve system or hydro zone. And at the top of a hill, if your landscape is on a slope. Here are filters and pressure regulators below, as you saw in the previous slides. Filters come before the pressure regulator because you want to keep the pressure regulator clean. Wires from the solenoid connect to the irrigation controller. If you have room, place your valves far enough apart to allow enough space for your hands and repairs. Be sure to create a map of underground piping. These above ground anti-siphon valves are easier to maintain and are what you most likely will see in residential properties. If you are on a hill or you want more 
information about your specific situation, please ask us in Q&A. On the right side is an example of an underground valve with the same components as the above ground valve, the anti-siphon valve we showed you uh, on the other side of the, the slide here, except for the backflow preventing device, which will be needed to be added close to the point of connection. Underground valves are less visible and a good choice for fire prone areas as soil is a good insulator and protects the valve from heat. It's a good idea to line your valve box with wire and gravel. So gophers, moles, and other critters don't fill up your boxes with soil. Hose bib assemblies, which are connected to your outdoor faucet are alternatives to permanently installed valves. They are especially useful for small projects, such as a vegetable garden or a particular part of your landscape. An easy do-it-yourself project and the way to get your feet wet in the world of drip irrigation. They consist of, consist of a battery operated timer on the hose bib. You have a valve, timer, backflow preventer, vacuum breaker, filter, pressure regulator. Even on city water, you can have small particulates. So you need to filter. Drip irrigation has very small openings that can easily clog. A pressure regulator is required to drop the water pressure between 15 and 30 pounds per square inch. There are multiple variations on these assemblies and ask staff at an irrigation store for help. They might have some ideas for you. The key components are circled here in this photo. If you want to be, if you want to have the ability to attach a hose, you can use a Y splitter before the timer. Mary Lou, would you please give us some examples of drip irrigation? Thank you, Mark. There are a number of ways to deliver water to your plants. Inline drip tubing has become very popular in the last few years for home gardeners. It has been used for many years in agricultural settings. Point source emitters, as shown in the top left-hand picture, have been around a long time and are good for many applications, especially sparse plantings. We will talk about each of these in turn. Okay, that's uh, <laughs> my computer just got. All right, um, note that you can use one half inch inline drip around trees and shrubs. Whether inline or point source, the emitters come in different flow rates. Let's compare inline drip with quarter inch inline drip. Half inch inline drip can be run for longer distances, 200 feet being the rule of thumb for 12 inch emitter spacing and 0.5 gallon per hour output on flat ground. It's great for landscapes where roots touch or intertwine and in large raised beds. Quarter inch drip line can only be run for much shorter distances due to friction within the smaller diameter tubing. 19 feet, for example, for six inch spacing. It also doesn't contain the same robust pressure regulating emitters. So plants at the beginning of the line will receive more water than plants at the end. For further details about your situation, check out the manufacturer's run charts on both the quarter inch and half inch tubing rolls. There are a number of companies that produce inline drip tubing. Make sure you choose inline drip that has pressure compensating emitters. We're gonna say that over and over again, but it's very important. Within the tubing are emitters that deliver the same amount of water regardless of differences in water pressure, hence the term pressure compensating. Meaning water drips into the ground at the same rate and in the same amount throughout your irrigation zone. This is especially important if you have uneven terrain and or long tubing lines. The emitters have a flexible diaphragm inside, which helps them be self-flushing, decreasing the dangers of clogging due to particulates in the water. These emitters also contain check valves, 
which means that water stays in the tubing after the irrigation run stops. This type of drip is effective in closely planted beds where you want to moisten the whole bed. It can be used on an empty area to which you will add plants or to retrofit established plantings. Ground covers, trees, and slopes are well suited to this type of drip. Inline drip, especially half inch, is best for well water as the tubing is less clog prone. Quarter inch inline is suitable for pots and raised vegetable gardens. Here's an example of a simple setup with half inch inline drip tubing. We call this design a serpentine pattern. Remember, 200 feet is about the limit of half inch inline drip. A flush valve should be added in your system to periodically flush out the tubing, especially in the spring at the beginning of the irrigation season. Choose a point close to the middle of the system opposite where water enters. The picture showing a uh, the picture showing a flushing system for this serpentine layout is made up of a power, a power lock T fitting, a short length of solid tubing, and an end cap that can be unscrewed and easily allow water to flow through. If you are using this setup to moisten a whole bed, the lines of tubing should be approximately the same distance apart as the emitters. For example, if you use 12 inch spaced emitters, the tubing lines should also be 12 inches apart for adequate moisture. You can also use a grid layout. This layout as the one before provides uniform wetting under the soil surface. We know your soil type determines how far apart the emitters and rows should be and the water application rate. For example, Santa Rosa has mainly clay or clay loam soils. So half gallon per hour emitters spaced 18 to 24 inches apart are appropriate. While West Santa Rosa has sandy soil and so requires emitters be placed closer together. This setup requires more fittings. We recommend power lock fittings, which we'll show you later. Note that in order to provide uniform soil moisture, tubing lines are spaced the same distance apart as are the inline emitters, like for the serpentine layout. Installing irrigation on slopes can be tricky. Tubing should be placed across the slope along contour lines. If the slope is especially steep, increase the distance between the lines as you descend down the slope especially near the bottom. The, the uh, tubing should be above the plants because water flows downhill. You may need extra check valves in the lines for a very steep slope. Otherwise, water will drain out at the bottom because the pressure above is more than the emitter pressure compensation can handle. Leslie, now that we know more about the components, what can you tell us about practical applications in the landscape? Thanks, Mary Lou. Goody, goody, I get to talk about projects. Let's first take a look at how to use drip tubing to water trees, which require infrequent and deep watering. You can use either inline drip or point source emitters and then you want to adjust as the tree grows. So your drip line should be placed at what we call the drip line of the tree. We're using the same terminology here, basically where the rain is going to drip onto the ground uh, following a rain or during rain, uh, that strange creature we don't know about. Uh, and that's about where you put your tubing. Now, some trees you need to have that tubing even further further away, depending on its root system. But this is a good place to start. You want to choose the appropriate gallons per hour and emitter spacing for your soil. Let's talk about raised beds. For continuous watering in a vegetable raised bed, half inch inline tubing in a grid pattern 
with appropriate fittings works well. It's sturdy and effective. This is how the Windsor Community Garden has set up their vegetable beds. And perhaps you can visit there and see how this works in practice. And although it isn't in this picture, they always have shut off valves, which you will see in the next slide. Here is a more detailed view of the drip irrigation components for a raised bed. Although raised beds are often used for vegetable beds, the same principles apply for raised beds with ornamental plants. Begin with a header line with tubing coming off of it. So here is the header line here, and you can see the tubing coming off like this. You can use quarter inch or half inch inline tubing, depending on the size of the bed. For your typical vegetable bed of four by eight, quarter inch inline drip works well. For longer or larger beds, half inch inline drip is more suitable. To evenly moisten the bed, the line should be the same distance uh, apart as are the emitters from each other. You can see these were probably approximated and that works just fine. Add shutoff valves for each line so that you can fallow that part of the bed or so you can isolate and do some repairs. Our food gardening specialists develop some creative ways to save water with lines further apart. And our Master Gardener website has more information. And I think there will be a link to the food gardening parts of our website on the follow-up email. So you can check this out. Now here's a slide that you may be interested in taking a photograph with your phone. So you can take it off to the irrigation store. If you have pots and want a good, good project to start with, here is one for you. And here is the shopping list. There, there are multiple ways to use drip to water plants in pots, uh, but this is a way that we like. The quarter inch drip works really well. And I've listed all of the components on the slide. We begin with a half inch uh, distribution tubing and you can see that in two places on here. This is on actually on my back deck. And from there, there is a quarter inch distribution tubing, otherwise known as spaghetti line, that comes up to the pot. Then there is a type of shutoff valve, quarter inch shutoff valve. And the irrigation stores have various names for these. But I think if you said shutoff or quarter inch, they'd be able to help you. And then rather than forming a T, if you do this as a single and put a goof plug in the end, then you can easily change out what is in your pot. You can just remove the tubing from it. For larger containers, you can uh, place the tubing around the plants in a spiral fashion. Now, pots require really short run times, only one to two minutes, generally on a daily basis, and they need to be on their own separate hydrozone. Mary Lou, would you tell us more about point source emitters and fittings? <laughs> Thank you, Leslie. Let's turn our attention to uh, point source. Now, what does that mean? Point source drip is effective in sparsely planted areas where you can tailor, tailor your system. You begin with half inch distribution tubing, then add individual pressure compensating emitters near your plants. They work in the same way as the built-in emitters in inline drip tubing. Be sure to use the same emitter rate on the same distribution line. Rather than wetting all of the area, you restrict your watering to the plants themselves. For clay soil like Santa Rosa and Rohnert Park, half gallon per hour drippers are recommended. The same as for the inline drip. Other parts of the county, like Sebastopol, have sandy soil. Higher emitter rates are fine for these soils. You can place the emitters either directly in the half inch distribution tubing or at the end of quarter inch solid distribution or spaghetti tubing. We recommend you minimize the use of spaghetti tubing around trees, shrubs, or perennials. 
as the connections are easily stepped on and broken. We use point source emitters to water specific plants rather than moist. Did I say that already? No. <laughs> this takes some care and thoughtfulness to tailor the emitter system properly. The emitter should be placed at least six inches away from the stem or trunk of the plant to prevent diseases and fungus attacks. The drawback of these emitters is that you have to expand your tubing configuration as the plant grows to match its root growth. Use the canopy of the plant as a guide as you see in the diagrams. It's very easy to install and forget. We've seen emitters tied up at the base of trunks where the roots have grown around and through them. Impossible. To begin with the plant, from a one gallon or smaller nursery container requires only one emitter. While plants from five gallon containers require two emitters and 15 gallon containers, at least three. As the plants grow, more emitters need to be added. Fittings are the parts that connect your drip line and allow you to make different configurations. Whether you are using half inch inline drip emitter tubing or a black distribution tubing for point source drip, we recommend power lock fittings. A number of different manufacturers make these all have similar names. Shutoff valves are also useful. One quarter inch drip, inline drip and distribution tubing both offer a number of different fittings analogous to those for half inch inline drip. For example, <clears throat> straight elbow T connections and shutoff valves. Tooth plugs have many uses. You can repair a half inch, half in, you can repair a half inch line when changing your mind and you can plug quarter inch tubing ends with it. Irrigation staples keep your tubing where you want it and close to the ground. They're easily forgotten. Leslie, please finish us off with some helpful hints and other important topics to consider along a drip irrigation journey. Thanks, Mary Lou. Here are some helpful hints, hints that we've learned over the years. The first is to use appropriate tools for the various actions you will need to put your system together. Use hose cutters or your pruners to cut your tubing. There are a variety of tools that punch holes in your distribution tubing, then help you to insert an emitter or quarter inch fitting into that hole. Although they were originally designed for inserting point source emitters, they also work well to insert the quarter inch straight couplings. For years, I would really struggle with getting those quarter inch uh, fittings into, into the distribution tubing. And certainly I use pliers and they will work too. Uh, but using this, the, this part of your punch tool to help put in uh, some of your uh, couplings is really helpful. Distribution and inline drip tubing can be stiff. We've all experienced that. And that makes it difficult to attach fittings or to place it in the landscape. Exposing the tubing to the hot sun in summer helps to soften it. The handle on your pruners can help to expand the open ends. And if all else fails, using hot water to soften the ends of the tubing can also be helpful. Gardening gloves with embedded nitrile are nimble and provide traction. We have focused on drip irrigation for this presentation. Another aspect is choosing a way to control your system, to control how much water and when. Here are a few criteria for you to decide whether to choose an irrigation controller, which is shown here just as a box with a sensor attached to it, or a hose bib assembly, which is here on the right, to manage your drip system. You can also use your phone as a timer and turn on your drip system manually. And then remember to turn it off when your phone dings. Now, don't forget, you need a backflow preventer and a filter and a pressure regulator. The criteria 
in whether to use a con irrigation controller or a hose bib or to work with it manually with your phone really depends on your comfort level, your budget, your ease of installation, including whether you plan to install it yourself or to hire somebody to do so, as well as the size and type of the project. Now you can have a fully automated system with an irrigation controller and valves, and then use a hose bib assembly for a temporary installation. And that's actually what is shown here. This is I put in an extra vegetable bed last year and set up a separate valve on, on a hose bib. Don't forget to regularly check your system. An irrigation system is only as good as it's maintained. Work zone by zone. We recommend that you flush your system at least once a year, more often if you are on a well. Now, when you're installing the system, be sure to flush it after you've installed everything and then go ahead and add your final end caps. You should also flush your system after you do repairs. Check that your lines haven't moved, especially important if you have pets, wildlife, and or children who may disturb your lines. We recommend that if at all possible, physically pull up the tubing and check for leaks and repair as needed. As your plants grow, adjust the tubing so that you are watering where the roots are, further away from the plant stem or trunk. Check and replace batteries in your hose bib timers. And in the winter, you wanna bring those timers inside and remove the batteries. If you have valves and an irrigation controller, make sure they are continuing to work properly and attend to them as needed. Be sure to have all these required items on hand. It will make your life so much easier. The tubing, fittings, goof plugs, and those staples. We recommend that you purchase your supplies from a professional irrigation store. Here is a list of the irrigation stores that are in Santa Rosa. There are others throughout the county. The components are generally of higher quality. They usually have a larger variety of components allowing for more versatility in what you can do. And you can get help from trained staff. We mentioned already that when you go in say with a picture of a, the hose bib assembly and say, can you make this for me? They can pull out those parts for you and show them, show you how they go together. We've given you a lot of information here tonight. So you can ask yourself, where do I start? So here are our recommendations. Begin with small changes. Choose a small project. For example, just one hydrozone. Uh, your vegetable garden, or a set of pots, or a small part of your landscape. Evaluate the effectiveness of your system. What worked? What didn't work? Don't be afraid to make mistakes. And ask for help when you need it. You can also help even ahead of time. And we have good resources within the city of Santa Rosa and master gardeners to help you. You can schedule a water smart checkup with the city of Santa Rosa if you already have an irrigation system and or, and or you can request a garden sense visit. These links will be in the follow-up email along with other resources that we put together for you. Liz has some more information for you about resources available from the city of Santa Rosa. Then we will be ready to answer your questions. Right, thank you so much for that informative presentation. And like Leslie said, I just had a few more slides before our Q&A. Uh, so first off, I really wanna reiterate that the city of Santa Rosa as well as all of the other cities in Sonoma County have long-standing commitments to water use efficiency. So take a look at Santa Rosa's website or your own city's website to learn more about their drought requirements and free resources to help you through this journey. 
Dailyacts and the Master Gardeners also have numerous resources and education courses to help you take your water conservation skills to the next level. I'd also like to highlight the green exchange rebate program that the city of Santa Rosa has to offer. This program is for Santa Rosa water customers and you can receive up to $1.50 a square foot of lawn that you convert into a low water use landscape. Again, the city, Daily Acts and Master Gardeners have resources that can help you understand the steps that you can take to transform your landscape and then to even install drip irrigation. For most of the rebates that your cities and the city of Santa Rosa have to offer are going to require approval ahead of time. So really be sure that you're checking out your city's rebate program and you understand all of the steps you need to take in order to qualify, apply, and be reimbursed for your water conservation efforts. One last thing before Q&A, for anybody who is on the program this evening, who is a Santa Rosa water customer, you are automatically entered into a raffle to win a drip line watering kit, and we will be in contact by the end of the week. And I think with that, it's time to get to some Q&A. I saw a number of really great questions in the Q&A box already. So I'll kick things off. Uh, we've got somebody asking if there's too much pressure in a hose and the connectors continue to disconnect and spray everywhere else, what would you suggest? I think we went ahead and we addressed that in the, uh, I think before this question yeah, we came did. up, yeah. that what you need is a pressure regulator. Yeah. And if that doesn't solve, if that doesn't solve your problems, you might have to put a pressure uh, regulator on your service line. Hmm. Sounds good. Thank you. Um, do you have recommendations for irrigation specialists to hire? I did see somebody drop in the chat. Moises. Hello, Moises. Good to hear you. See you here. Is there anybody that you would recommend or any resources to find some additional support? We have <clears throat> we have a QUEL, which is an acronym for Qualified Water Efficient Landscapers. And all the people who have taken this course, it's free and also offered in Spanish. Uh, they have gone through the latest uh, ideas and, and methods for irrigation. So you can feel pretty good that they're gonna know what they're doing in a, in a water saving way. And Leslie, could you tell more about that? And, and so Quell is, uh, and both Mary Lou and I are Quell certified, it turns out. Mm -hmm. And though we are not out for hire. No. We are not out for hire. We, no, we're free. We're free. <laughs> we're free. We come on Garden Sense visits. And of course we have Mark, as our, who's been a professional irrigation specialist for so much of his working life, that if you uh, ask for a Garden Sense visit, then... Um, then we can help you get started, but we won't actually do the, the installation for you. You can go to quell.net. And Liz, I don't think I included that on our resources. So if you could include that in the follow-up email, that would be great. Oh, and Liz has just put it up there as well in the chat very fast. Thank you. Yeah, Quell is a phenomenal resource. Thank you for bringing that up. Um, we got a couple of questions asking for some more clarity on flushing a system. And what do, how can you actually clean your emitters? Um, the, bi the biggest thing is to make sure you flush out at least once a year and make sure your filters are clean because the, sp the small particulate matter. Um, if you have an existing system that has clogged emitters, you might have waited too long to flush it out and you might have to replace that e either that inlight tubing or those emitters at the end of the quarter inch tubing or, or built into your distribution tubing. It's just a matter of, you. I, I would first try to flush it out, flush the whole line out and see if I d you can dislodge everything and then, and then just turn it on and, and see what happens. If not, you might have to replace that section of half inch tubing or quarter inch tubing or whatever it is. Thank you. Um, so a lot of folks have, I'm sure that you've had experience with this, have inherited irrigation systems that have <laughs> numerous yeah. different yeah. issues. Um, 
so a lot of these I probably will just read off their specific issues, but I know that this is a constant problem. So if you all have any advice on how somebody can troubleshoot an inherited irrigation system, and I guess I'm curious, how can somebody work with what they already have? Or would you recommend if a system has a number of different leaks or is wound up around a plant and isn't doing well, what do you suggest? Do you salvage what you already have or do you start fresh? You can do either one depending on where you are. The first thing is you can ask for a garden sense visit and uh, we, we can help <laughs> you evaluate and say, yeah, okay, trash that. Or, you know, this, this looks like it might still work. We're not allowed to touch your stuff, but we can certainly make suggestions that way. I saw there was a question about um, somebody using half in, using inline drip and loops around plants. Mm -hmm. And as long as it's a distance away from the stem, that's good. If you really, really, really wanted to add another um, button dripper on there, you can do so, but you want it to be the same emitter rate as the inline drip. And uh, you probably sh won't need to do that, won't need to add, add um, a point source, but that you can do. And, and if, yes, if I'm reading one of the, the Heather's, Heather's question here, if one of the button drivers come up, comes off, yes, you're going to have a leak. Mm -hmm. And so you want to make sure that you plug any leaks that you have. And, and then more suggestions from my compatriots. Um, uh, yeah, I've, I've just told people, uh, but that, you know, it's very important, Leslie, what you said, because it's important to see the situation each each situation has its own particular problems or benefits so uh really uh, knowing more about that would would be the best thing to do and mark sorry and that's okay and even if you haven't in inherited a system you have your own system you got to remember like we've said before is you your irrigation has to grow with your plant material mm -hmm. it's yeah. a constant you know it, it might not be every year it might not be every other year but Eventually, you have to move those emitters out to the drip line and, you know, address any leaks that are happening because you don't want to waste the water. You want, you want the water to go where you want it to go. Not yeah, where... those feeder roots don't want to go into dry soil. No, no. Yeah. Now, one thing that, that we're hinting at and not even hinting, really being clear about it, is you need to maintain your system. And even though we're into this stuff, and so on. It's so easy for us to forget. I went out into my one part of my garden the other day and discovered at least three leaks. And and I have gophers, you know, and gophers like to chomp on those on those on those and lines. So bulls. And bulls do too. <laughs> Mary Lou has bulls. I have I have gophers. And uh, and so you really need to check regularly. And, yeah, and if you if you don't have voles or gophers, you might have children. Yeah. And children and are... or dogs. Or, or wildlife deer, or deer yes that are constantly especially with point source emitters they're more likely to dislodge those emitters or that tubing than if it were inline tubing so yeah. something to consider and and it's so easy not to see it and so that's why we recommend pull up the tubing when you can and and walk the line mm -hmm. um and just take the time to do that uh you do that and and I, there was something, no, it'll come to me, about quarter inch drip, I think. Um, it's one of the reasons we don't recommend spaghetti because it is so, so easy to trip on that and, and have it rip out of the half inch distribution line. Oh, I know what I was gonna say. If you have, like I had, you know, you have a system in and you go and add some stuff to it. I had, you know, a piece of tubing like this with several pieces of half inch, of quarter inch distribution to it coming off. Rather than trying to, you know, change my mind and put little goof plugs in, I tend to cut out sections that have a lot of mess like that and go ahead and put in your, your power lock straight couplers and in a set, or put in a fresh piece of black tubing and start again in that area. Black tubing is cheap. Inline tubing is a little more expensive, but it's worth it, worth the effort. Definitely. So when we're talking about maintenance, would you all mind describing in more detail what you mean when you say flush out a system? How exactly do you do that? 
Where are you? You take off the end cap that you put on there. I know a lot of people may not know where a zone, if they, if they have an established garden, they have inherited something, they may not know where the end of their drip line is. So you have to pull it up and you have to trace it out. If you do know, it may be stopped or crimped with what's called a figure eight uh, fitting that uh, used to be used. We do not recommend them because they do crimp and uh, you have to take off the fitting in order to kind of uncrimp the line and flush it out. Flushing out means running water through it to push any particulates out. And an end cap that it screws on is the easiest, most effective way to do that. The other, the other thing you, part of the reason where we suggest that you do a, a system check in the springtime is, is water sitting in the line all winter long, you might have algae or, or, or all kinds of things going on inside there. You need to flush all that out. And, and most people that we run into don't even realize they have filter units on their systems and some of them don't have filter units on their systems. Right. So it's important to make sure you have a filter and pressure re regulator and that you check, check and clean that filter periodically. Um, and another thing is if you discover that you don't have a flush on your system, you can go ahead and put it in yourself. Your tubing is plastic. You just cut in, put a T, put a little short line and, and an end cap on there. And there you have your built-in flush. And it's a good idea to put something there. I have a friend who puts a gnome right in her garden where her flush is so that she knows where, where it is. So she's reminded of, of where that is. Yeah. <laughs> That's a great way to make irrigation a little bit more fun. Yeah. <laughs> so you started to talk about this a little bit with having the same uh, gallon per hours when you're mixing systems. Can you mix inline and point source? Mm -hmm. yes, you yeah. Can. Yeah. All right. As, as long well, as they are the same gallons per hour hmm. or very close to. Yes. Thank you. And are there any disadvantages to leaving an entire sprinkler system or component in the ground, but having it turned off? I think what you want to do is make sure you've capped it off well enough so you don't end up with a leak. Yeah. But Mark, you might be the best one to, to talk, address uh, this. It, yeah, you, it, it, there's nothing wrong with doing that. It's just, it's, it's difficult to maintain mm -hmm. and, and to make sure that everything is working properly. And one thing we, sh we show people um, when we do uh, garden sense visits is how to read your meter so that you can detect leaks that you might have in your irrigation or inside your home. So uh, it, it's important to, uh, to have it accessible. I mean, there's nothing, you know, there's, there are some people that do subsurface drip irrigation. We don't really suggest it because of the maintenance issue, okay. but uh, um, that works out well. Back to the, your, your question about uh, emitters on inline drip. What we s tend to see sometimes is that people, people are used to sprinklers and, and they'll put these micro sprays on their systems. Mm. And, and just, just as a warning, it, it, it get, it, all the advantages to drip are out the window when you do yeah. that. I mean, uh, because you're, you're not putting water where you need it necessarily in, in the fungal issues and the and, 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 and also the distribution rates on most micro sprays are very high. So if you run them at the same, for the same period that you're doing your inline drip or your point source emitters, you're overwatering with your spray heads, yep. your micro sprays. And they fall down. They fall down, they get kicked down and yeah. And then the- Easy top, to break. And the tops will come off of them and- <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So anyway. So we do, as you can tell, we, we have particular opinions about this and strongly recommend inline drip. Yeah, well, we invited you for a reason. So I really appreciate <laughs> you sharing your expertise and your experience. I, I had mentioned to the group previously, but in my experience with irrigation, the best practices seem to 
ever be evolving. And now I've I've yeah. gotten very familiar with inline. I've strayed away from spaghetti. I had a, a whole plethora of issues with that. And inline seems to be tried and true. Remote, it all depends though. Yeah, it depends on on yeah on what the use is. So exactly. Yeah. In yeah. my in my garden, I have nothing but inline drip. Yeah. I have no point source emitters at this point. Mm -hmm. yeah, but definitely I love how you all brought up the fact that if you do have large uh, unplanted areas between plants and irrigation, then maybe point source is a better option. So you're not it's important to keep your your um, soil healthy and well irrigated, but maybe it does make more sense to have point source. Well, the other... actually, there's another way to do this, and that is to have blank tubing between mm -hmm. in the areas. Mm -hmm. So that's what I have out, out in my front yard is I've got trees and shrubs, and I've got, I've, I've basically built um, circles. You know how it, it, it always stays round, even if it's been out in the sun. So I just have big loops that are around my trees, but it's all connected to just straight black tubing. Mm -hmm. regular distribution tubing rather yeah, you, than you, you can split you can splice that anywhere yep. so that yep. you're, you're not watering those spaces between the plants right so just with a couple of couplers a couple of couplers you just basically <laughs> cut a section out and you put your couplers in and then you you've eliminated all those emitters in that space yeah, yeah. a lot of opportunities for creative design with yes. irrigation mm -hmm. absolutely yeah um, we got a question from MB about the Garden Sense program. Do you all do consultations uh, focused on irrigation for food gardens? We we don't really do that um, because food gardens are high water use, mm -hmm. and we are focused on. Uh, and the way we got started was uh, with landscapes. Um, Garden Sense was begun way back in 2013 when. Sonoma Water was trying to get people to get take out their lawns and some of our master gardeners said hey we can help you with that and help you know suggest some plants and so on and and so our focus has been on ornamentals now that being said if you happen to have a vegetable garden when we're visiting some of us know a little bit about vegetable gardens and and can give you some advice at that point but we're not the specialist and there are tons of stuff about food gardening on our on our website yeah. Not. So that's that's where we recommend you look. And, and again, that link will be in the follow-up email. What about food forests? Would you do a consultation for like fruit trees and the abundance of different fruit trees and how to irrigate that? Uh, again, we're not specialists in, in, in fruit trees. Um, and we can't necessarily use the, the excuse that they're high water use, although there are, some are low and some are medium, but it, it's, it's really more of a specialty not uh, talking about um, fruit trees. So yeah. some so what, of us know more than others. Well, one thing we, we always stress, no matter what kind of plant material you, you're using or you're watering in the landscape is make sure you mulch everything. Yeah. I mean, because, uh, and, and make sure your, you know, your fruit trees are all their own separate hydrozone. You yes. know, it's just, but mulching is very important in order to retain that moisture level in the soil. Yeah, keep it away from the trunk. Yep. Mm. yep. And use organic uh, compost mulch uh, as much as you can rather than in fire prone areas, uh, chips. Yeah, irrigation seems like it's it really is just one practice in the whole um, tool belt for water conservation. Right. When you pair right. mulch with drip irrigation with the right plants with a fire safer landscape, you can really have right. a healthy, <laughs> robust landscape no matter how big or small. There are so many different things that we can talk about when it comes to water conservation, soil health, food. And one, one thing we, we always stress is that um, people usually over plant areas. And so if you plant plant material that'll fill the space and not overtake other plants, you, you, you're gonna use less water because you're only gonna be watering those plants and not the open spaces. So. When you buy plants, you buy plants that are going to fill the space and grow to that that the size that you want, not buying plants that you constantly have to maintain and keep them in shape. So there, there's advantages to that. Plus, you can always, you know, when you when you have to weed, there's there's room to find the weeds. <laughs> so true. So if somebody has a faucet that is 
not necessarily located right next to their veggie bed and they need to go a distance with their irrigation. Would you recommend that they bury the irrigation so that folks are not tripping over it? And if so, how deep would you bury it? What, what we, we sometimes tell people to do is put it on the surface and then mulch over it so it's not a trip hazard. And if you do want to bury it, um, you certainly can with PVC. Um, it's a bigger do-it-yourself project. And I believe you want to be at least 12 inches down. Mark may, yeah. know, may know that. That's, that's something I learned. Uh, yeah, on lateral lines, you anywhere from 8 to 12 inches on a lateral line because it doesn't freeze here as much as it might other places. Um, but yeah, if you, if you have a large area and it's far away from your hose bib or from your, your valves or whatever else, you can go and, and, and trench and, and run PVC all the way out to your plant materials so you're not running drip tubing out there. And then when you get out there, then you convert over the drip tubing. Yeah. And, and then you can go for country. Yep. Yeah. 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 And if you, when you use the word bury, that has, uh, that has implications of depth. Yeah. Where when I say I'm going to cover my uh, irrigation tubing, I mean, I'm just going to cover it. You know, so you can't see it, but it's easily pulled up and, and I know where it is. Otherwise, if you bear, you're gonna get, you're gonna get roots, and you're, oh, it's good. Mm -mm. Yeah, no but PV, PVC is more robust, and so yeah. if you, but you're gonna need the glue, and you're gonna need all the fittings. You're definitely gonna need help from the irrigation store. Mm -hmm. um, but I've got several places where I have trenches going from valves, and um, hired a young weightlifter to help dig the trenches for us. And, and then went up and, and used drip inside. So you can do it, but it is, you know, for a first project, um, it might be easier to figure out another way to go online. And then at a later point, you can add your system by doing that digging and connecting it either into your hose bib and to your, and to your bed. And you're more comfortable with your irrigation system. And hand, and hand digging might be better for the winter time. <laughs> yes, definitely. <laughs> definitely. Yes. And especially on clay soil in Santa Rosa. Yes. Yeah. Yep. Sounds like you're speaking from experience. Yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so Ruth here has inherited an irrigation system. Uh, their system currently has half inch tubing and is fitted with quarter inch tubing and spray emitters. They want to switch the sprayers over to drip emitters. Do you have any tips that you can share? Well, she can, there's usually quarter inch tubing coming off of the half inch tubing feeding the, the micro spray. You can add an emitter at that point, depending on where your plant material is, or you can take the half inch tubing, put a T in it and, and bring it to where you need your, your water to be distributed. So you can do it either a quarter inch or a half inch. I prefer to do it with half inch because you might be a distance from the plant material or you might have to go away from it. You, you, this, this tubing might be right at the plant material already. So you need to move away from it. You know? So depending on how much tubing there is in this situation, you might be better to, better to run a new line and, and, uh, and reestablish where your watering is going to happen. And it sounds like a garden sense visit might help you with those decisions. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> what a phenomenal program. <laughs> it's much easier to see it and, and, and explain it. it yeah, I mean, seriously, yeah. it's easier to see it. And uh, yeah. yeah. Because we see all kinds of things out there yeah. and it is just mm -hmm. much easier to explain things to people right. on site and to see yeah. their situation. This is making me just my head spinning about a part two. How do we get this in person and allow people to see the various um, installation pieces and then the what went well and what didn't go well and how we can all learn together, make repairs, things like that. In person is much easier. And and Liz, can I give a little little promo for another upcoming webinar? Please do. Um, Zero Waste Sonoma has got the Zero Waste Week coming up and uh, Chris Loomis from Sonoma Water 
and I are going to be answering questions about leaks and maintenance and that kind of thing might give you some more practical stuff to apply some of the stuff we've been talking about here. And that's on uh, July 26th. Fantastic. I'll include a link to that in the follow-up email. Oh, that'd be great. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, so Heather's asking, is it ever appropriate to use different gallon per hour emitters in the same system? Mark? <laughs> yeah, yeah, this is a part question. If, you're, if, if you have a particular type of soil and you have this plants in a hydro zone that require the same amount of water or same type of water, watering, it's, it's, it's better to stay with the same emitter types. But if, you're, if you've got an existing landscape where all of a sudden you're, you're, you've got all kinds of different moderate use plants and low water use plants, uh, I would really consider pulling some of those plants so that they, and planting plants with the same water requirements in the same area and staying with the same emitter. Mm. I mean, I've, you've, I've seen it in a lot of places where people use different size emitters depending on the plant needs. And uh, it's hard to schedule a timer when you're doing that. It's, and also, because you're not necessarily just scheduling the, the emitter, the soil is the same, so it's going to take it at a certain rate, and so that that's where the difficulty comes in. Is you you have soil that only take water, the what we call the infiltration rate is, is going to be the same for the same type of soil, and you're not going to have a whole lot of different soil types in a, in a landscape. Leslie or Mary Lou, you got any oh. input on that? <laughs> uh, I agree. And uh, yep, yeah. <laughs> it, it, yeah. You see it happen all the time. People think they can do it all the time, and 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 they put it in all the time, um, but it doesn't always work the best. You know what would be better if you do have that situation, the mixed situation that Mark was uh, talking about, is that you just add another emitter of the same gallon yeah. per hour than the one that's the one you have. So what you're doing is you're, you're adding another emitter, but you're not adding a different flow rate. Mm -hmm. Thank so you. Everybody's Mary. copacetic on the line. Yeah, that's that's better, Mary Lou. Yeah, the flow <laughs> the the flow rate that we talked about in the presentation is dependent on the soil type, and and so it as Mark said, so it really should be the same. Gallons per hour. You just might want to put more in if you. For, for example, just happen just by chance to have a medium water use plant that you're not willing to give away, like a hydrangea, <laughs> that you know you might put extra emitters around it. Not that we're recommending that. Or the one we rose. Or the one the rose, rose. Or the one rose bush that somebody bought you this year. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, we all have plants that we're we, that we're atta attached to. And there's a reason they're there. And then gardening practices have changed as we've learned more about low water use. Uh, gardening and and as and climate change and drought. So sometimes you make these little fixes for it for this, and, and we all do it. We're, we're, I'm not going to claim to be to be no, perfect. Yeah, <laughs> we're all we're all learning. Absolutely, we all are. And with this question in particular, would you say if you had a blank landscape and you're planting low water use, medium water use fruit trees, for example? You, if you set yourself up, you can have different zones for it as yes. well. Yes. Right. Yes. yes. Yeah. So you can have three valves for three different water type needs. But yes. absolutely. I definitely recognize a lot of people do inherit systems or have existing landscapes and are trying to retrofit and improve. So it's it can be a challenge, but we all all are in this together. Yeah. The other uh, other hydro zone is for native plant material. Mm. So you might. You might want a different hydro zone for your native plant material. Right. As, as an example of the number of hydro zones, when my husband and I worked moved into our house, um, there were exactly two valves. And on top of that, it was black tubing underground in gopher country. So after a number of years, that disappeared. And we went to hose bib timers. And then after master gardener training, I got all psyched and, and put in valves and a controller. And we went to 12. So from two valves at the very beginning, which was simply landscape plants in the front and landscape plants in the back, we went to 12, 12 valves. So sometimes on visits, we'll say, you know, you might, we look for those extra valves that people aren't using 
So we can say, here's another hydrozone for you. You want to take care of those trees and you've got that spare valve to do it. And you also have to have capacity on your clock to add those valves. Exactly. Or, or Mark, can you add a second controller if need be? You can add a second controller, but it's, it's better to, to buy a controller that has plug-in options so you can increase the amount of valves it can handle. Yeah, that's the best way to go. Great recommendation. We've had somebody in the chat uh, named Mark who has described a number of different issues that they're dealing with with their own inherited system. Um, you all can take a look in the chat, but Mark, check out Garden Sense. I think that might be your biggest benefit here from cut lines to different tubing and, and emitters that are broken and spray emitters. Mark sounds like uh, your irrigation <laughs> is due for a retrofit. Retrofit, yeah. yeah. Um, so we've got just a couple more minutes. If there are any last questions, please, please feel free to uh, drop them in the chat or the Q&A. Sounds like Mark is going to check out Garden Sense. Yay. <laughs> Agreed. What a phenomenal program. There, there was a question about drip tape. And um, I, don't, I, I don't know much about drip tape. Uh, perhaps Mark can comment on that. It's robustness compared to half. It's, it's not as durable. There's all different types of drip tape. There's some that are almost like half inch um, drip irrigation, but uh, but not as durable. And then and then there's some that are is almost like a tape that you unroll and, mm -hmm. and you can go distances. So it's it's not as as durable for most landscapes over time, and so you might have to be replacing it more often. The other, the other issue is I don't know how critters will go after that, you know, birds mm -hmm. and whatever else, because it is a lot more lightweight and they, you know, the birds might be pecking at it, you know, or the gophers or the, or the deer, deer will chew right through a line to get the water, you know, so, um, uh, and squirrels too. I mean, let's not forget everybody here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, all the critters. <laughs> all the critters. Right. That's right. Uh, what would you do if you already, if you have already established converted irrigation system and it only has a few zones? Um. You can, one thing you can do, particularly if you're trying things out, is that, and your valves are full, that you're using all your valves, you could go ahead and add a hose bib assembly. And that could also give you the practice of setting up a zone and, and deciding, okay, do I really want to be watering this and how to do it? You can actually set up your drip system um, and you can later go ahead and upgrade how you control it. So you can start with hose bib timers. I'm sort of going in a couple of ideas here. You can start with hose bib assemblies and then decide, hey, I'm just gonna take the plunge now. I've had those for a few years and go ahead and, and get a bigger controller and add some more valves. Um, so the, the, the other option you have is, is uh, they make a device called a splitter where you can add valves in the field and it works like a toggle where the first time your irrigation runs it waters valve number one and the next time it waters it valves, waters valve number two. So that's just another tool in your tool belt that you can use possibly getting a splitter or a doubler it's called. That way you don't have to increase your clock size and you can still have the advantages of you know, using uh, more valves. But the problem is, is that you can, you can only schedule that particular station for right. a certain amount of time and it'll affect both valves. So if they have to be basically the same kind of water needs on both valves. Good point. Good point. I know I maxed out my valves on my property and I put in a hose bib timer at a far off faucet. And because I'm not going to or have anybody dig through all the rock that I have in my landscape, I mean, that's just not going to happen. So this way you don't have to trench anything and drag a wire down there and PVC down there. I just put the hose bib timer on the faucet and it, it waters my little area far mm -hmm. off, no problem. Yeah. But you have to maintain that too. Yes, yeah, you have to remember that. 
And then what you have to do is remember where you put the timer when you bring it out home in the winter. What very <laughs> careful place did I store it? Yeah. <laughs> That this has been really fantastic. And maintenance with everything is, is essential. Yeah. None Be of essential. us just install it and leave it. Right. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Well, we're at time. I think that you all have done an amazing job covering an introduction to basics. Leslie, thank you for the plug for an upcoming program about how to detect leaks. Um, this has been fantastic. I can't say thank you enough. For those of you who are still on, thank you all for being here too. I will send the recording and follow up resources, hopefully by the end of the week, no later than next week. Um, I know there are a couple other things in the chat. MB, I think you and I should touch base offline. I <laughs> uh, would love to offer some support to you. And for everybody else, happy gardening. Good luck. Thank yeah. you for doing your part. I hope to see you all soon. Panelists, I'll see you in just a minute in our debrief session. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Have a great rest of your evening. Bye. Bye.